Hello and welcome to Forging a Minecraft mod lecture number three basic blocks. So the last time we spoke about items, how can we do use them, what can we do with them, how do we register icons and so on. So now it's time to do the same things but with blocks. Some things are, are similar while some things are different. So let's get going, shall we? Here we are in Eclipse and well if we're going to work with blocks it makes sense to create a package called blocks, don't you think? Here you go. And I'm going to put it here, like that. And what I'm going to use is a um, a class called block machine. So this is going to be a block that I'm going to create. There you go. So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to extend the block class, like so. Import that and pick the correct one. The one we want is obviously the Minecraft one. So just import that one. Right. And of course we need a constructor. And what we're going to be asking f ask for is the ID of this block. And the super call, we're actually going to send some something more along. We need to tell it the ID, and we also need to uh, material. Need to tell it's material. Um, and I'm going to. We have a bunch of different materials here, and I'm going to use the iron one. I think that makes sense. So the material defines a few different things, not too many, but we can go and take a look actually. So if we right click here on iron, materials iron, um, we can click on something called open declaration and that's going to take us to where, where it's defined. So now we are, as you can see, in the material.java uh, file. And we can see that the iron material has been defined so it should use the iron color in the map and you have to use a tool to, to mine it. So it doesn't really define too much but we, we can have we have a few different ones here. Uh, so we have glass uh, how that is defined and and so on. So I'm just going to use the predefined iron. You can of course create your own material. Next thing to do is set the creative tabs. And the one I'm going to use here is the redstone one. We'll see in a bit why. Creative tabs, sorry, redstone, like so. Import that. So we have the creative tabs over there. And finally, the things we might want to do is set the hardness. That's how tricky it is to break, basically. Um, so I'm just going to choose two. But you can, of course, use different ones there. And that is what makes the difference between breaking uh, a piece of stone and a piece of obsidian. And another one thing I want to set is the uh, sounds. It well, it's going to play when we step on it. And I'm going to use the metal footstep there. So, what is this block? Um, did I spell that wrong? Yeah, it's a set step sound, not set step sound. Well, so, what is a block, you might think? Well, you might think that that's a very trivial question. Of course, it's something you place, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, so, sort of. But it's very nice to know exactly what the block is. The same goes with the item. We had an item and we just had one base item. One base item and then we created item stacks with this item. The same thing goes with a block. We just create one basic block. We don't have one new block for each well place we put it in. So we have one base block that we refer to from in the world. So the world is a uh, big three-dimensional grid and what it does is, is that it refers to our base block by its ID. So each little grid, well position in the grid, has an ID that refers to the item. Another more, more important thing maybe is when we pick it up we don't have the block. That's an item. So for each block that we do have, each base block, we have and base item for it and that item can be used in item stack. We will see more about that later on in the, in the second part of this lecture how that um, connection between a block and an item works. But we're going to create a block and that's going to give us a corresponding item to it. So we create a one single instance of this block. 
So it, it it might be a lot of a lot to take in, but we'll see during this lecture how how it all works. So set on localized name. So I can't spell unlocalized name like this. So we need to set the unlocalized name. Uh, to do so, I'm going to use the uh, machine unlocalized name uh, that I have in block info. Of course, I don't have that. So I'm going to do this a bit similarly to what I did with the items. I had, um, if we take a look here, I had a item, uh, or is it item info here, that I used to um, to define things like uh, the unlocalized name, the localized name, and so on. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So new class uh, block uh, info. Right. Um, and I want to specify a few different things uh, to start with. And not only the unlocalized name, of course that's one of them, but I also want to define the ID of this item. Uh, why is it? There you go. Uh, public static final and a key used in the config file. Machine key. Like that. So that's the, what's going to be used in the config file, like I said, and then the default value of the ID as well. And I forgot to mention that last time, which um, you shouldn't be in caps, um, which IDs you can use. For items, uh, we can go all the way up to 32,000 uh, with the IDs. And for the blocks, we can go from 0 to 4,096. Since the blocks goes from 0 to 4096, 4096 not included, we can't use the items there. So we can't w w really do uh, w make an item with ID 300, because that should be for the blocks. And we shouldn't use IDs that are already used in vanilla, so we shouldn't like use ID 2 uh, or ID 3 or even ID 0. Don't use that, that's A. Eh. Um, so, um, 2075 seems like a good ID for this block. Well, the default ID that is. Final string. Uh, so here we go with the unlocalized name. Localized name. And I'm just going to set that to silly machine. Seems like a good unlocalized name. So how this uh, works is pretty much the same uh, as with the items. Like I said, we have need an unlocalized name. Uh, and then we need a localized name, and it's just going to be called silly machine. Isn't that a good name for a machine? I believe so. So now we can, if we head over to block machine again, we can all of a sudden set this uh, unlocalized name to this thing here. Uh, apparently not. Um, oh right, it's not saved. I think that's the issue. No, apparently not. Let's let's take a look. I probably misspelled it. There we go. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. So just set an unlocalized name, and then we give it the string for the for the unlocalized name. Of course, we we have set that name now, but we we need to set the localized name as well. So um, well, together with actually creating the. Um, creating the blocks. And like I said, I'm going to do it uh, in a similar way like I do with the items. So I'm going to have a class here called blocks where I initialize everything and set the name. So public static public static void uh, in it here. And people in the chat are talking about, well, this ID might clash with another mod. Yes, that's totally true. That's why we have a config file. You can't predict all the, uh, what, what the IDs all other modders use. Um, so here I want to set that part where I create it, and then I want to have a method where I add in names as well. So how do we do this? Well, like I said before, it might get a bit well, too much, but it's like with the items. 
So <laughs> what I want to do is uh, public block uh, machine, and then I set it like this: machine equals new block machine, and we just give it the ID, which is in block info dot uh, machine ID, like so. And we're going to import the correct block, and the block we want is obviously the one from Minecraft. There you go. Uh, sorry, this should be static. There you go. So when we call this init here, it's going to um, create a new machine like that. But this is actually not it. I said, well, it's a lot like the items. Yes, that's true, but it's not exactly the same as with the items. So what we need to do when we create blocks is you not only create it, we need to register it that we have this um, that we have this block. So for the items, we could just create it and that was it. For the blocks, create it and register it. So we have two steps. So how do we register this? Well, we do game registry dot uh, register block, here we go, and what we want to do is this one here, the one where we give it a block and a name. So the block is easy, that's just machine, but what is the name? Is that an unlocalized name? Is that a localized name? What is it? It's neither actually a localized uh, nor an, a unlocalized, so it wouldn't make sense to have that. So what it is, is basically sort of a key, an ID, to this block, so so when we register it, we can sort of uh, separate the different blocks we register from each other. And uh, yes, because that's the case, I want some sort of key. I'm actually not going to bother uh, about defining another one. I'm just going to use the same as I use for the config, uh, of course, block info dot machine key. But I want to stress this, it doesn't have to be the same, there's no connection there. The only reason why I use machine key is here as well, because I need some sort of key, and it makes sense to use the one I have, just because I have it already. Nothing more than that. Okay, so that's that part, and how do we register the names? Well, we do it like with the items. So, language registry dot add name the one here. I will need to give it the object and the name, and the object in this case is just the machine, whereas the name is the name of everything. Block info dot machine name. There we go. So now we have two things left to do before we can see our very first block in, in action. The first thing we need to do is, of course, to call these methods from the um, uh, from the actual mod class where everything is loaded. Uh, blocks dot added names. There you go. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, of course, to include this in the configuration file. There's no reason to have a configuration file to load the IDs if we actually don't add that code. Okay, so what do we do? Well, like I said many times before, like we did with the items, config dot but not the same still, so we use get a block instead, and the key is um, block info dot machine key. The default value is obviously block info dot uh, machine key, and then we get the integer from there. Note here, however, that I'm not subtracting with 256. That's only for items. So if you have an item subtracted by 256 um, to make sure that uh, well, uh, you get the same ID. Uh, why is this complaining here? You there? Um, oh, why have I used the derp? So obviously we need to use the default value, not the key there. Uh, so, so for items we need to subtract with 256 to make sure it works properly. We shouldn't do that for blocks. So now we load the ID in the configuration file. From the actual mods file, we make sure to call these two methods. Uh, there you go. These two methods are creating the block and registering the block. Remember, you need to register the block as well, otherwise, it won't show up and you can't use it. And we also add the name to it. Uh, the block itself is fairly simple. 
we just send the IT and the material along. The material here is default as iron. You could of course add another parameter here where you define the material. We set the tabs to redstone, we set the harness, how tricky it is to break, the step sounds and finally the unlocalized name. So if we run all of this we should see uh, well, a block with textures and we haven't well give it any functionality but it still should be a block. I'm going to move this up so you can see it properly. Hang on a sec. It's just going to load. There we go. And we need to create a new world, of course. So I'm just going to go into creative here. Call this lecture uh, lecture 3. And let's make that super flat. And then create a new world. Right, Dio. Let's see if it starts. It's just preparing the world and everything. There we go. So, yes, here's the super flat world here. And if we go into the redstone tab, we have the silly machine there. As you can see, we can just place it in the world without a problem. And it's called the silly machine. Obviously, it has no textures. So, what's the next step? Of course, we want to add textures. And, well, how do we do that? Sort of like for the items. Right, so what do we need? Well, I want three different icons. You can have more than that if you want to, but I want three. I want a one on the top, one on the bottom, and one on each and every side. So the, the side one is obviously used for different times. So the first thing I might want to do is to define those in um, block info here. The first thing is to define where they are texture location and I have this method oh, not method sorry the constant in uh, I, the item info as well and if you wanted to you can just refer to that they should be the same thing the reason why I have it here as well just to show you um, well that we have it here so we can refer to it so so you could just refer to item info dot texture location it wouldn't make a difference because we should have the same anyways. So just to sh show you what, what we actually have to uh, well to show you that we need example there as well and then we need the uh, different textures public static final uh, st uh, string machine top and the texture of the machine top is machine underscore top, quite simple. And if you're watching this live and want to follow along with these textures, I, uh, I'm sure we can get them into the uh, chat, and um, then you can just download them and place them where they should be. I'm going to show you where you should place them. If you're watching this recorded, you can just get all the textures from the uh, lecture page, because you can get, find the full source there. Okay, so the bottom one is called machine bottom, and then we finally have the uh, side one, machine side equals machine underscore side, like that. So now I have defined just the path to these different things. So if I drag this along here, um, this is the MCP folder that I have that I renamed to Steve's example. I head into source, I head into Minecraft. Here we have the code that we have in example. However, we have assets here from last time when we did the items. Then example. The reason why it says example here is because we have example here. That's the only reason. We've told it that the texture location should be example and therefore we should place this in example as well. Then we have textures and here we have blocks and items. Items well, here we have the icons from last time, the wand and the cards. But of course, since we're registering blocks, we'll have to put it in blocks. That's not optional, that's how you have to do it. Open up here, and here we should put all the different textures. As you can see, we have more than just three, and I will use them later on in this lecture. Right, so let's continue and go to the actual code for loading these textures. So let's head over here and what I want to do is first of all 
define three different um, icons that I can can save for later. So side only, um, private icon, top icon. So here I want to store the top icon. I want, uh, oops, I should define it as well. Side dot clients. Sorry about that. And then I can, yeah, I can just copy this like that. So I want the top icon, I want the bot icon, or well the bottom icon, I guess I'm going to call it bot, and then side icon as well. And a lot of errors here, just import everything. And the icon we want is obviously net.minecraft.util.icon. So if you're, um, well, if you're not sure which to import, usually if you have a Minecraft version and a non-Minecraft version, the Minecraft version is the one you want to go with. I say usually, uh, you might want to have another one, but um, this should be in caps, sorry. There you go. So that's just to store them. The second step is obvious, obviously to register them uh, from the path, uh, the path that we do have. So side.client and then override. So we want to override a method where we, um, we register these ones. So it's actually called exactly the same register icons and then I can register and we, I'm going to call it register. Okay, import that. There you go. So how do we do this? Well, you, you've heard this before. We do it like for the items. I'm sorry, but that's the, how it works. We do sim things similarly when we work with blocks. Top icon equals register dot register icon, and then we just give it a path. And obviously, what we want is block info dot texture location, wherever that is. Can you see it? There you go. Uh, so that's the, the folder that we had, and then inside that folder we have textures, then blocks, and then the actual file. So we want that location, and then a colon. And finally, the name of the well texture. Remember that we shouldn't add the extension, so we should just do uh, block info dot um, machine uh, top. So we shouldn't add dot png or anything afterwards. We should just have, well, that location here, then a colon, and then a name not the extension. Right, and then it's time to, well, add the other things here. Um, and I'm just going to copy because, well, they are quite the same. So we have the bot and the, the side here. And then we obviously need to change the names. Okay. So now we have the three different icons being loaded from, from the folder, basically. So we register the icons from the textures, and now it's just a matter of showing them. Of course, showing them is not the same thing for items and blocks. For blocks, we have multiple sides. For, for items, we do have damage values. So we use another method here, but the idea is still the same. Side only, side.client. And then I want to override a method called, you can never guess it, get icon. So yeah, it's called get icon. Uh, it's good. We have to return the icon to use. What parameters do we get? Well, we get a side and something called the metadata. We'll talk about the metadata later on in this lecture. But for now, the only thing we're interested in is the side itself. So the side is an integer and, well, we have the side 0 all the way up to uh, side 5, the different sides of the block. Okay, so side 0, that's the bottom one. So we want to return the bar icon like this. The side 1 is the top one, so therefore I want to return the top one. Side 2, and side 3, and side 4, and side 5. We obviously have them, but we don't really care which one is which because we want to use the side texture that we have for all the different sides. So I'm just going to use else return side icon, if I can spell it like that. So what I have now is, well, the three different icons there. I register them and then I tell it which one to use depending on the side. Do I need anything else? No. I can just start it.
here we go. Okay, so hopefully we'll see a proper block with proper textures. Otherwise we have failed. There you go, the silly machine. So as we can see, the sides here have the exact same textures. The top have a texture and the bot have another texture. There you go. Sweet, so it's a, it's a bit darker than the side. So it, it's pretty easy to just make a block like this. Now we have a block. This is actually a fully functional block. It doesn't do anything, but it's a block like like planks, for instance. Blo planks don't do anything either. Um, and it was fairly simple to do. We have different uh, textures on different sides. And if we want to include these in recipes, it's fairly simple. We just do, you might have guessed it, the same as we do with the items. So when we register in a, a recipe, you've seen that we can use um, uh, well, the item itself or an item stack, and the same thing goes with, with blocks. We can use item, item stack, or block. Sweet. So what's the next step? Well, that's up to us. What do we want to do? Well, what I'm going to do is add some functionalities to this. A, a block, it's, it's fun. Uh, it's fine to have a block, and it, it, it's nice, but if it doesn't do anything, it's well, it's still good, I guess, but it's boring. So I'm going to add some different functionalities to this block. How do we do this? Well, we override some uh, some methods, of course, of the base block. Oh, well, the, the block class, uh, this one here. Okay. I'm going to define a method here. This is not going to override anything. You can see that because it's private, but I, it's going to help me uh, when I work uh, with 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 other methods, and yes, you read it right. It says spawn anvil. I want to be able to spawn an anvil in the world at a specific location, like this. So how do we do things? How do we set blocks at specific locations? We need to import world as well. Um, well, what we do is just tell it world dot set block, and we don't set the block to a specific specific block that we do have, we don't refer to like block dot anvil blah blah blah. What we want to do is we tell it the location in the world and then we give it the block ID. How do we do this? Well we refer to the anvil and then do block ID like that. So how this works is basically you have this three dimensional grid that is the world of Minecraft. In each spot you can have one block and each block type has an ID. We have set that ID at that specific location and that's going to make sure that we get a block there. Observe that we still just have one base anvil block, but if we tell it to have the ID of the anvil block at that location, it's going to look like we have an anvil there. But this is going to override the, the method that we have, well, not the method, the block that we have there already. So if we have a piece of dirt there and say, well, I want an anvil here, then it's going to replace that. So what we can do is use another method to make sure that um, is a block. So the um, block at a specific location is an air block. Uh, we just give it the coordinates like so. And if it's an air block, we can set the uh, current block to be of the anvil type. Right. So what should I use this for? Well, Let's make something something fun, yeah, something fun. And what I'm going to override here is a method. There are plenty of methods to override, uh, but the one I want to override is on entity walking. So when an entity is walking on top of this um, block, I want to do something special. But remember, I just have one base block. I just have this very uh, block machine. I don't have multiple block machines. I just refer to it by its ID when I place it in the world. So that's why I get the X, Y, and Z coordinates here as well as the world itself. Because, I, well, we know we have this block, but we don't know where it's placed. Just because we just refer to the to the base block. We don't create like a new block there, a new block there, a new block there, and so on and so forth. And yes, world.isAirBlock is much better than comparing if the ID of the block equals to zero, because, well, 
models can define blocks that counts as error blocks if they want to have have blocks that shouldn't really really well do anything uh, well, for the user, user can still place blocks there, and well, obvious can still still place blocks there, but it might want to do something with them, like placeholders and stuff. So it's better to just use world dot is air block. So we get the coordinates here and the world, and those well will obviously be used. But we have to do one thing here, and that is we need to make sure that we are on the client side. Remember what I said last time, when we want to do something, like change something in the world, we just want to do that on the server side, then the server side will tell the client side what's going on. So instead of doing it on the client side, well, we do it only on the server side, so everything is kept in sync properly. If the client side starts to mess with things, things that are not uh, specific for, for the client, like graphics and stuff, it, it's going to sort of be, be a getting out of sync because the client do is mess messing around. Uh, so by doing this, well that is remote, we check if it's a cl the client side, and then we invert that with the exclamation point there. So not well that is remote. And what do I want to do? Well, if you step on this item, well this block, we of course want to spawn a a well anvil 20 meters up into the air. I thought that was obvious. There we go. So let's see how this works. So the same thing with items. How we add functionality is basically that we extend uh, the, the block class and then we override the methods and we change the functionality there. And there are plenty of methods. There are methods for when we activate a block, when we break a block, when we place a block, when we walk on a block. So there are, there are a ton of things. And obviously, I won't use them all. So now, if I have this circle here, well, not circle, it's Minecraft, and walk here, and you will see a lot of anvils falling down. Of course, this block is not not balanced in any way at all, because well, we'll get free anvils. And as you can see, it didn't spawn it on each and every block, just because well, if if we ran past it before it had time to update, it wouldn't how time to spawn it, it wouldn't recognize that we walked on it. We could change the uh, tick rate that it used. The default one is 10, uh, so it updates twice a second. But we can update that if we wanted to update quicker. There you go, a death machine. Right, but why did I place this in the redstone tab? This is not a redstone control at all. It's, it's a deadly trap, but still. So what I want to do is, if I give it a redstone pulse, then I want it to drop some anvils as well. A nice trap, right? Well, how do we do this? Well, you can't really just say, well, on redstone pulse received. That's not how it works. We have to sh check if a nearby block, a neighbor, a neighbor block, was just updated. So if it was just updated, we can check, oh right, it was updated, maybe we have some redstone nearby. If we check for redstone nearby all the time, it's going to be a heavy load on the server. So don't do that. What we do is, when something has been updated, check if we have redstone nearby. And by redstone, I don't mean redstone dust. What I mean is anything providing us with redstone power. So how this works is, we override something called on nay per block change. And what we'll get here is the world and we get the coordinates of the the block, uh, the machine block. We don't get the coordinates of which neighbor that changed and I misspelled neighbor completely. I'm just going to fix that there. And we also get the ID. I, I'm not entirely sure why we would use it, but we do get it. Okay. So the first step is obviously, you should know this, to make sure that we are on the server side. We shouldn't do anything on the client side. And the other thing we want to make sure is the following. Is block indirectly getting powered and X, Y, Z. So like I said, we don't want to check for redstone dust. That has nothing to do with it. We want to check if this block is getting indirectly powered um, like this. And that means that we get some redstone signal here. So what I want to do is each time you send it to redstone pulse, we want it to, to do things. However, this is not the best thing of doing it. It's not uh, completely solid. Now what we do is if any blocks 
near it updates we're going to run this code and if we have any redstone powering it it would um, well do this thing so if we had a lever uh, which is on so we always give it a, uh, some power and then just replace a block next to it all the time it's going to do this thing inside here. If we wanted to make it properly, uh, I'm not going to have time to show you that, but if we want to make it properly, what we want to do is just store the old state. So we say, all right, the last time we checked, we didn't have a redstone signal. So, and, and now we do. And if we didn't have last time and we have it now, that means we just turn it on. And if we had it last time but not ha don't have it anymore, we just turn it off if we want to do something when it has been turned off. So that's how we have to do it. Uh, it's going to be a part of one of the further explorations of today's lecture. Uh, implement that in, in this block. So we're just going to do it the simple way. We're just going to assume that, well, things works all right. Don't do that in a proper mod. So what I'm going to do here is just being very evil. You know, it's nice to have an ev evil block, right? It's a silly machine after all. So what I'm going to do is have a nested for loop here. So I have two loops here. And they will just uh, loop from minus two to, well, yes, two, 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 basically. So five different numbers. And that shouldn't say I. That should say J. Like that. Uh, so that's going to loop through 25 times, f 5 times 5, and for each time I want to spawn an, a, spawn a anvil. That makes sense, right? Not, not really, but this block is a silly machine, it doesn't really make too much sense. It's just an example after all. So by doing this I'm going to spawn a 5x5 um, five five square of anvils up in the air, 20 meters up in the air. Let's see how that works. Right, so if I do it like that, and I add a, uh, oops, it's too, too far down, sorry about that, um, and then I add a button here, and right click it, boom. Um, well, poor player, I say, but of course, it, this is not balanced at all, we can just get free, um, free animals like that, so if you want, would, would want to make this balance, you would have to add something that the player has to supply it with anvils or make your own block that it can spawn and that works like anvils, they just fall down and deals a lot of damage but they they won't be able to use like for repairing weapons or anything. Like that. So that's that one, but I mentioned metadata and what what is this for? Well, metadata is a way of storing more information. Like I said, we just have one single block, so we can't store the information here in the block itself. Uh, it's the same thing that we did with damage values. For for items, we can have a well the ID of the of the item stored in an item stack, as well as a damage value, which go from zero to somewhere about thirty. 2000. We have the same thing for blocks. We have the ID of a block at the specific coordinate and a metadata. But for metadata, we can go from 0 all the way to 15. We have 16 different values, nothing more. So we're a bit restricted there, but the ID is the same. We store the ID and some extra data. And the reason why we do so is that then we can have unique information for, for different instances of this block. Remember, we just have one base block, so we can't store the information in that block itself. Right, so what I want to do now is allow the user to disable this block. So, so it won't spawn things, it won't do us any harm. Uh, when we walk on it, it won't drop anything. And for that, um, first of all, going to want another icon to represent that, um, uh, well, that this... Uh, machine has been disabled and then you will of course be able to re-enable it. Private icon and disable icon like that. And I'm just going to add it like this. Okay. Disable icon and of course I need to add something here here as well. 
And as you might have seen if you t took a look on the textures, there of course is a, a texture for it that I have made already that is in the uh, in the appropriate location. So block information here. And what I want to do is just add a machine disabled, I think it's called. I'm just going to make sure that that's the case. And yes, it is. Right, so now we have that part uh, where we can store it and where we can, um, well, register it here. Um, right. But now it's a matter of returning the correct one here. And I want to do that depending on if it's disabled or not. So to do so, I can just check the metadata right away because obviously I want to use the metadata to define this. So we don't have a global variable that defines if it's disabled or not. That would be silly. Then if we disabled one of the blocks, we would disable all of, of the blocks. And that's not what we want. So what I'm going to do is define a method here, private boolean is disabled, and we get the metadata here, and then we return if it's disabled or not. And to start with, I'm actually going to change this, but, but, but to start with, I'm going to define, so if the metadata equals to one, then this block is disabled. So I can use this here, so if is disabled, uh, and then we send along the metadata that we already get here, uh, sorry, there, if that's the case, then I want to return the disable icon. Disable icon. Um, otherwise, I want to return the normal top icon. So as you can see, I'm using the disable icon, uh, disable icon instead of the top icon. So the top icon is going to change depending on if this is disabled or not. The other icons will stay the same, as you can see. So that's that part. What's the next part? Well, we want to prevent things from happening if it's disabled. So what we can do is just do uh, is disabled. But here we don't get the metadata on its own. So what we have to do is ask the world for the metadata. And what we do is just world.get uh, block uh, metadata like so. X, Y, C, like that. And boom, it should be done. There you go. And the same thing should be, of course, put in, uh, in here. Uh, because, well, we don't want it to spawn things with the redstone if it's disabled. Right, and what we want to do later is well, well, it's fine now. We don't do, need to do anything, right? Well, we might want to allow the user to disable it or re-enable it because we don't have that code at the moment. But we have textures that represent if it's disabled or not, and if it's disabled, we don't want to do things. So, right, that's the only thing left, right? Override, and what I'm going to use is a method called on block. Activated, activated like that. I think that makes sense. Um, well, I guess that's the one I need to use. And we get the well. We get here. We will get a lot of parameters. We get y and c. That I'm going to use those. I'm not going to use the player which activated it. I don't need that. And I'm not going to use which side the player activated it on. And I'm definitely not going to use the hit x, the hit y, and the hit c. Uh, what these things do is basically tells us where on the block we clicked. This side makes quite a lot of sense, that's which side we clicked on, whereas hit x and those guys might not make too much sense. Basically, if you click in the middle of, of the face, you will get 0, 5, 0, 5 uh, on two of them, and the other one would be 0 or 1. So it's basically where inside the block you clicked. And usually you don't need that, but if you're making something more advanced, it might come in handy. Right, I'm going to return true here, which makes sure that, well, we did something here when you activate it, don't do the normal thing, like place a block or something like that. Well, dot is remote, so make sure that we are on the server side. And what I'm going to do is calculate the new metadata I want. World dot get block metadata like so, and we get, just get it like before. If the old metadata equals to zero. I want a new one to be one, otherwise it should be zero. So as you can see here, I'm just saying that if you were disabled, then you should be enabled. If you were enabled, you should be disabled. And of course, we need to set this again. Well, dot set block 
metadata. And here we have five different parameters, not just four. So we have x, y, c, and then we have the new meta. And the last one is a bunch of flags. So depending on what we give it here, it's going to update it uh, differently. It's going to notify everything differently, like is it going to be sent to the client side, um, is it going to notify the, the surrounding blocks, blah blah blah. What we usually want to use is three. Why? Well, trust me, that's what we usually want to do. If you want to do something more advanced, well, then we'll have to take a look in set block data with notify to see uh, what that flag actually does. But that's not anything I'm going to have time to go over right now because we're already running out of time. So what I have now is when we activate this block we're going to sw uh, swap the metadata back and forth and this is going to be unique for every placed block that we have because every placed block is well having its own metadata even though we still have just one base block. So if I put these ones here I can now uh, right click them to change the texture back and forth there we go and as you can see they don't affect each other because they all have their own metadata and they don't share that information with each other of course if I step on this one it's going to spawn an anvil well two because I stayed out too long and moved a bit if I'm going to move on this one it's not going to spawn anything at all because it's disabled if I enable it and do it and oh right this is a bit far down I'm sorry about that it's going to spawn that anyway so right clicking it's just going to put it back and forth because we have defined so it shows different icons depending on well different top icons depending on the metadata itself and when we're clicking we want it to change the metadata depending on its old metadata but that's everything for now we're going to see some more things with the metadata and also some more relations between blocks and items after the break so like i said that's after the break so i'll see you in 15 minutes